get to the word today. We are coming from Genesis. This is a lectionary passage, Genesis 28, starting at verse 10. Genesis 28, verse 10. It should be on the screen momentarily. If not, you could get out your paper Bible if you steal paper Bible saved. Amen. All right. The word of the Lord reads, Jacob left Beersheba and went to Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for a night because the sun had set. Taking the stone of the place, he put it under his head and laid down in the place, in that place. Amen. Listen, I'm hearing me in 3D. <laughs> Verse 12. And he dreamed that there was a stairway set on the earth at the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The lamb which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. 15, know that I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Woo. Verse 16. Then Jacob woke up from his sleep and said, surely, somebody say surely, surely the Lord was in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So Jacob arose, he rose early the morning and he took the stone which he had placed under his head and set it for a pillar and poured oil on top of it and he called the place Bethel. Amen. That's a whole lot. Y'all ready to dive into it? May the Lord bless God's holy word as we dive in. Today I'm going to speak on the subject between a rock and a hard place. Between a rock and a hard place. Has anybody in the audience been in a rock, between a rock and a hard place? Has anybody, do I have any witnesses? If I, we were to go to the dictionary, it would say the definition is a situation when one is faced with two equally difficult choices or circumstances. Anybody been there? Stuck between two equally bad decisions or situations. You know, as I was uh, researching, it's funny that the origin of this, of this phrase is actually originated in the U.S. in the 1900s when it was used during an economic crisis when the mining workers faced low wages at the work, which is their workplace was the rock, and in the, in the mines, that was on one hand, and then on the other hand, they faced unemployment and poverty if they refused to work. So they were stuck between a rock and a hard place. My God, my God. Being black in America, we can say we are stuck between a what? A rock and a hard place. We didn't ask to come here. And then once we got here, we can't really, I mean, we could go back, but it's not our culture, it's not our language. Where, where are we going? Which, where are we pinpointing? What tribe? And then the heart, then we stay here and what we gonna face while we here and all the things. We're rocking a hard place. Young people in the hood, they want money. Everybody want money, everybody wanna look good. But if you go to a failing school system and it's the society tells us the only way you can get some substantial amount of money is to have a good education, you stuck between a what? Rocking a hard place. In a dating situation, You might not be in the ideal relationship, but the idea of going back to the dating pool, which is slim to none, might make you feel like you in a, my God. 
Your boss and your co-workers get on your nerves. Oh, I got a witness. They the worst, but the, you know, some other jobs are available, but they at a lower rate. You stuck between a rock and a hard place. Well, good. I'm, I'm glad that I got uh, con some, some constituents who are in the, in the building who are feeling the same thing because I got good news for you if you are indeed stuck between a rock and a hard place because that means, according to our passage, that you are a great candidate for an encounter with God. And this is the thing. I don't care how messy your life is right now. Anybody got, no, you don't have to raise your hand. Just give me an eyebrow. Anybody got a little messy life right now? Don't, don't give yourself away. Just wink at me. You know, in a messy situation. But I want to just give you some context to our passage. Because if you want to talk messy, we could go messy. This situation that Jacob is in is messy. It's, it's, it's real housewives and husbands of the Palestinians. It's giving... Telenova before it even existed. <laughs> this is a whole situation. If we were to, if you go back to read a couple of situ couple of chapters in Genesis, Jacob been out here doing the most. He stole. He first of all, he's a twin. His twin's name is Esau. He uh, stole Esau's birthright on a, on a bet about food, right? And then uh, when his dad is getting older, their, their tradition was the father would pass on a blessing. The dad is getting older, and Jacob got the nerve to impersonate his brother, who was a hairy man. Jacob was a smooth man. He going to put on sheep wool, going to do the whole, change his voice, going to smell musty. He did a whole thing to take, to fraudulently take his brother's birthright. His brother's blessing. So he took his birthright and he took his It's a whole thing. Mama helped. It was, it was, a, it, y'all, y'all looking at Netflix. I'm telling y'all need to read the Bible. It's just as, a uh, baby. He took the blessing. So where we get into this passage, Jacob is on the run. Esau just found out what happened. He said, I'm going to kill him dead. When I saw it's on sight. It's on sight when I see you, Jacob. So Jacob and his mom put up the, uh, a plan. You got to go to your, your, your uncle's house, and he lives 500 miles away. Imagine walking 500 miles away. He had to flee. He was fleeing for his life at this moment when he arrives at this camp, and he, has, he goes to sleep. He's on the run. He's been walking. He's tired. So if you want to talk about messiness, we are in a messy situation. He's on the run. He's camping out. And verse 11 tells us something very interesting. Verse 11 says, taking the stones there, he was tired. He put it under his head to lay down to sleep. He put a rock. He used a rock. I want you to imagine this, because some of y'all don't even like your pillows right now. <laughs> he used a rock to go to sleep, to lay down, to get some rest. Now, I know that that sounds odd for us in our 21st century context. But back then, in ancient times, pillows were usually made of stone. Fun fact. Uh, it was, while it wasn't the best, you know, situation, it was designed actually to avoid insects and other critters from crawling into your hair and into your mouth, into your nose, into your ears. It was kind of a necessity. You would have wanted to have been propped up and not just laying on the ground. Y'all with me? But it speaks to how we can normalize hard places. Sometimes we can normalize situations even if it's out of necessity. Y'all feel what I'm saying? Even though there's no real comfort or relaxation, sometimes we just learn how to thug it out. Anybody been there before? It's not really giving much. It's not giving you anything, but you know I got to do what I got to do to keep it going, keep doing what I got to do. We just learn to be comfortable in hard places. Anybody ever been in a hard place? You in a hard place right now. You don't know where it's going, but yet and still, you just got to sleep in that hard place. 
it doesn't seem like you got any release from that hard place. But I just want to propose something to you. Perhaps that hard place, could it actually be a place of rest? Could your hard place actually be a place of rest? As Pastor Mike Day Wiley yesterday, can we just give it up for Pastor Mike, the way he moderated, the way he curated the space? It was pure brilliance. It was genius. If you were there, I hope that live stream is available. Um, but one of, when I got to go through the exhibit, I, I wasn't expecting to be as moved as I was. I thought it was just going to be the Obamas and the little cute and the little flowers. But when I walked in there, I was blown away. Did anybody else see the exhibit? Yeah. Blown away. Bodies went, and while we're speaking of uh, Jacob laying on a stone, I just wanted to show one of the pictures that was particularly striking of Kahinde Wiley. Just take a minute just to sit, to take this in. And while I'm, I'm preparing of Jacob laying on a stone, on the ground. It was the one that thing that struck me the most about this, all the paintings was that you could hardly um, decipher whether people were resting or if they were in dire trouble or if they were dead, right? And it just goes to show how sometimes for black people, the option of us resting is so foreign that we automatically think something's wrong. This person is dead. Something's happening because black people don't, we don't just lay down and be at peace. Right? This is where I'd imagine Jacob was doing. Laying on the ground, laying on a stone. But could he have been, could it have been a place of rest? After all that he had been through, maybe the hard place was setting you up as it did for Jacob for rest. How many need to be a candidate for rest? I know we've been waiting or working on it. It's a foreign concept to us, especially as in California, trying to make a living. But that brings me to my first point. God wants to encounter you in a hard place. And let me tell you, the messier your life, the better. Did you know that? The messier, the better. The more complicated, the better. The more situationships you're in, the better. Because encounter simply means to learn a new facet of God, to see God in a way that you've never seen God before, to really know like, oh, this is what the love of God feels like. This is what faithfulness is. This is how God wants to pour out on me, a new facet of God. Perhaps the hard place is just a setup for dreams. Not just any old dreams, a God dream. This is what Jacob encountered in the hard place while he was laying his head on a stone. God encountered him and gave him a God dream. A lot of us have our own dreams. You got a list of all the things you want to accomplish and all your to-dos for the year. But perhaps God wants to give you a God dream. Something that God wants to put on your heart, a passion, a pursuit. How many times do we stop and say, God, what is your dream for my life? What is your purpose for me? I know what I want to do, but God, give me a God dream. Somebody say that. God, give me a God dream. Yes, y'all sound good. Jacob has this dream, but in this dream is crazy because he gets a promise and he gets a blessing. What does he get? Which is incredible to me because Jacob was dead wrong at this point. Jacob was foul. They have been doing all the things, bro. Like, no, go sit down somewhere. Jacob is wrong. He just cheated his brother. He lied. He did all, he was manipulating. He did all the things in the, at this moment. But yet God comes to him in a dream and gives him a promise and a blessing. He says, one, about his kids, that they would be a blessing. And as we, if you were to read the passage, his kids um, became the 12 tribes of Israel. They're kind of important. Like it's a thing that's going to be going on into eternity. Like all of Jerusalem and all of Israel and all Judaism is set around these 12 sons that Jacob had. 
And then he also says, I'm going to bring you back to where you slept right now is the promised land. I'm going to bring you back to it. Does Jacob deserve this? Jacob been acting up. Jacob doesn't deserve any of this, but people, if they were to look at Jacob at that moment, they saw a mess, but God saw a blessing. I want you to take, be encouraged about that. If your life feels like a mess, if you messed up a lot, you made some mistakes, the Bible doesn't excuse anything Jacob did. It says that God still blessed them in spite of. Can you receive that? Can you receive that? God, I done did a whole lot of foolishness. I made some mistakes, but you don't see the mess over my life. Instead, you are seeing a blessing. Can you imagine God's blessing over your life? Come on, you got to start using your holy imagination and say, God, I see it. I believe it. God, I'm a mess. My life is a mess. But people, and we got to be careful how we look at others too. The people you already done wrote off. Oh, they ain't no good. They ain't, they, they always lying, always stealing. All. Don't. God sees differently than us. God sees differently. What leads me to my second point. God's promises do not require your manipulation. I'm going to say it again for those in the back corner. God's promises does not, they, it does not do, it does not require your manipulation. See, Jacob thought he had to connive. He had to scheme. He had to finesse. He was born second. The firstborn gets the blessing. So how can I get that spot? Sounds a lot like capitalism. Sounds a lot like our Western mindset. It could only be one. Number one, one Messiah, one per one thing. It's only top dog. That's all we know. But Jacob was like, I got to get that blessing. I got to get that blessing. My life is not going to be nothing if I don't get that blessing. So he steals, kills, destroys. He does all the things. When it turns out that God already had a blessing over his life that he didn't have to do nothing for. Come on, I want you to take heart in the situations that you feel like you got to finesse. You ain't got to finesse it. You ain't got to move, make moves. You don't have to move things around. God already has a blessing. What would Jacob's life have been full of peace and joy if he would have known already God already got you? You ain't got to do nothing for this. All you got to do is just live and be good to people. But because he did, now he's facing consequences. He's on the run. God was actually using Jacob and Esau as a, as a symbol. As in, I wish I had a whole nother sermon to talk about this, but that's for another day. How uh, Esau was the first covenant, Jacob was the second covenant, and how the second covenant was going to be greater than the first. It was all symbolic. So all he had to do was relax. Somebody say, relax in your blessing. Relax in your blessing. It's coming. You don't got to do nothing. All you got to do is just stay steadfast. You don't got to, you ain't got to trick the system. You ain't got a good hookup. Let God do what God wants to do. So Jacob wakes up. He has this dream. He wakes up and he says the prayer you never want to pray in church especially in church. In verse 16, he said, surely the Lord was in this place and I was not aware of it. My God, that's the one prayer you don't want to pray in church. God, you were here. You were moving. Miracles, signs and wonders were all around. My peace, my joy was all around me and I didn't know it. God, I, this is our prayer. God, at the way, don't let us be distracted when it's time to worship. When, it's the, when, we, when your presence is in the house, don't let me be on Instagram, Lord, checking my timeline. God, don't let me be nodding off. Don't let me be talking. Don't let me be passing notes. We don't do that no more. Y'all used to remember we used to pass notes? We used to get in trouble for that, too. Don't let me just be sitting there watching others worship. When your presence is available to me, God, let me be more aware of your presence. 
Do you know the presence of God? There is fullness of joy. How many need joy? You walking around, we doing everything else for joy. But I'm telling you, if we tap in to the presence of God, Lord, help me to be more aware. Let me be more sensitive to when you're moving. Don't let me be too cool or self-conscious to worship you. When you come into this place, it's a one-on-one situation. Everybody else disappears. I can really care less of what you think of what I do if I jump, if I leap. If I do a cartwheel down the middle aisle, don't worry about me. I'm becoming more aware, God. We don't want to miss a move. Come on, say that. I don't want to miss a move, God. I want to be aware. I want to be aware. I want to be aware. So as a result, in verse 18, Jacob did something. He woke, he woke up early the next morning. He took that stone that he used for a pillow, and he set it as a pillar, and he poured oil on it, and he called that place Bethel. You got to get the picture of that. He took the pillow, set it up, poured oil on it, and he gave it a name. Here we learn something very remarkable. You can give God that hard thing and turn it into a memorial of praise. Do you hear me? The thing you're going through, that hard time, that hard place, that hard situation, instead of laying it, he took the very thing he had to lay on. The very thing he had to try to get peace, the very thing he could have had insomnia over, the very thing he took it and then he turned it around and he used it as a memorial of praise. Could it be that God wants you to take that hard thing, that hard situation and turn it around to say, God, I thank you. God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I give you praise. God, I don't know how you're going to work it out, but I know you're faithful. God, I don't know what I'm going to do with this person, but I know that you're in control. God, I give it to you. I'm turning it back to you as a place of praise. So standing up a stone would would, would, um, symbolize a covenant. God, I'm making this vow to you. I'm pouring oil on it. It's consecrating it and making it special. And it's, it's time for us to do this in our hearts, in our lives. Jacob gave this, name, this place a sacred name. He called it Beth El, which means house of God. The house of God. Think about this. He called it the house of What was a very dark place became a sacred place. What was an unsure place became the gateway of heaven. It was a place where heaven and earth united. The place where heaven and earth came together. My last point, point three. God is inviting us into our Bethel moments here at The Way. God is inviting us into our Bethel moments here at The Way. Where this place is truly the house of God. Where we encounter God in such an amazing way. Lord, and the people who would say, Lord, I'm so grateful for this house. Anybody grateful for this house? For all the times that you have met us here over the last 18 years. How many people can be a witness that God has truly met you in this place? Over that you've come here with mess. You've come in here confused. You come with situations. How many came here ready to throw in the towel? You came here, I don't know what to do. I come at the end of my rope. I came hopeless. I came addicted. I came all kind of complications in my life. But this is the place where God met me. Anybody got that testimony? This is the place where God met me. Think about all the times where God showed up in your mess. Think about all the times you've been here. And like Jacob, we are consecrating this house. Come on, somebody say this house. This house is our Bethel moment. And not just one. When you come to church and be like, ooh, that was good. No, but perpetual moments where we're continually having encounters with God. Anybody want to sign up for that? Where you're continually meeting God in a new way. God's showing you new revelations, new facets, new things. Like, God, I didn't even know about your mercy. You're just pouring it out on me. I didn't even know. I knew you was faithful, but now I really know how to trust you. Right here is our Bethel moment. We can encounter God 
in our hard places. We can see things from God's perspective. We can see ourselves the way God sees us right here in this house. This is why we're celebrating our anniversary. This is why we have that love in the Old Testament. They would always bring memorial stones. They would always have a place of an altar where they would remember this is where God brought me from. This time last year, I didn't know what I was going to do. But I got this one tangible thing to say, like, oh, I remember I came to church that day, and I heard a word, or that worship really came through. It hit just right, and God changed my life. Anybody got that testimony of I'm just by myself? God, you changed me. Anybody been changed like the old Hawkins used to say? A wonderful change. <laughs> Anybody got a wonderful change testimony? Did anybody come into this house one way and now you're a completely different person? Come on, we got to give glory to God for this house. This house will be called the house of Bethel. The house, that, the place where we encounter God. Even in our hard places, even in our messiness. Come on, if you got a messy situation, I will advise you to stand on your feet and begin to give God praise. God, I know you can do it. God, I know you can do it. God, meet me here. Meet me now, oh God. I need a God encounter. How many people need, like, no, I really do. How many people, like, I need to see God in a new way? God, I need you to show me. I got, and I got problems. I got things I need solutions for. And I know I can only get it from you. Now, I'm all for online church. And if you're out of the area, we love you. Thank you for watching. But if you can get in this house, I would advise you to get into this house. Because it's something about the atmosphere. It's something about the presence of God. Amen. It's something about being in community with somebody else. Somebody else would be like, oh, I know what you're talking about. I live through it. And you say, oh, if you can do it, I can do it. And we be encouraged in Jesus' name. And you know what else I'm happy about? God often does God's best work between a rock and a hard place. He does his best work. And I'm so glad. That even though we may be laying on pillows of stone, anybody got that? You, you, you laying on some hard places. You got some hard situations. You laying on it. But I'm so glad that I know the rock. I may be laying on a stone, but my foundation is the rock. Amen? I got the rock of my salvation. Pastor Mike talked about it last week, that, that foundation. How many got that rock that you can stand on? It's that rock that will not crush you, but will lift you up. How many are glad about it? I know the rock. Come on, tell your neighbor, I know the rock. I might be laying on a stone, but I know the rock. I might be in a hard situation, but I know the rock. That rock is Jesus. How many are glad for Jesus? I'm happy for Jesus. Glory, God. We give you glory. We want to encounter you. Continue to bless the way. Continue to bless this house. God, continue to bring people into this place to come to know you in a new way. God, we just thank you that deliverance will break out, that there will be miracles, signs, and wonder. People will be healed. Come on. I feel healing in the atmosphere. If anybody needs a healing, come on, raise your hand and say, God, I need a healing. I don't care what the doctor said. I believe God. All right, we're stretching our hands to Lauren. God, heal her ear in Jesus' name. God, we thank you for your healing oil, that it will return to her as normal functioning. If anyone else need healing, come on, raise your hand, because this is where, this is where we encounter healing, Sister Donna. We might even need healing for our heart. Come put your hand over your heart. Healing on your mind. God, we need you to touch us in this place, because this is where we encounter you in community. Sometimes we have our isolated moments with God, but we need us. So God, bless the way. Another 18 years and more. God, continue to bless our pastor. Continue to lead him and guide him. Continue to strengthen him in the work that he's doing, oh God. We give you thanks for the way. Come on, let's give God thanks for this house. We thank you for the way. We thank you that we can come to a church and worship you freely. We thank you that we have a place that we can come and everybody's welcome. God, we thank you, God, for your love and that we can feel that's so tangible. Thank you for the joy that we can feel in this place. God, use us. 
Use our resources. Use our creative gifts and talents. Let this be a beacon of light. We give you glory. We give you glory. Between a rock and a hard place is where God specializes. They don't sing that no more. God specializes. My God. They don't say that no more. We got a specialist named Jesus. What are for, our, for our reflection questions, I just want you to ponder. Take a moment to ponder. What place, what hard place is an invitation for you to encounter God? This is your homework. This is something you take home and think about. And how can you intentionally lean into more Bethel moments at the way? When you come here or when you log online, don't come as a consumer. Oh, I wonder what God going got for me today. They I hope they sing my song. And I'm leaving right after because nobody better not talk to me either. Let's not come here to consume. Let's come here to give. Let's come to lean in. We don't, we don't need Lauren to tell us when to lift our hands or when to clap. We should come with the praise in our heart. Come with expectation. God, I know you're going to do something. I know you're going to move in some way. I'm looking forward to somebody being healed, somebody being set free. God, I know you're going to do something in our midst. Let's lean into our Bethel moments. God, we give you praise. We give you praise. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.